What's up everyone, Jay's Two Cents here, and before we know it, the summer heat is going to be upon us. So that's why today I'm gonna to take some of my best water cooling advice, cram it into one video to try and make your next water cooling adventure an easy one. Today's video is sponsored by audible.com slash Jay's Two Cents. And if you've got a busy lifestyle like me, you probably don't get to read books as often as you probably should. But that's why Audible is perfect because I can listen to my favorite titles while multitasking and building systems like this or just driving to and from the studio. And I am a huge fan of the self-help section. I need all the help that I can get. But I'm gonna be checking out the book, The Power of Habit. That way I can make better habits in 2018 in an effort to improve myself this new year. Now you can get a free 30 day trial membership as well as a free book that you get to keep forever by heading to audible.com slash Jay's Two Cents. The link is in the description below or just text Jay's Two Cents to 500 500. But the best part is members get a free book every single month that you get to keep and it never expires. So what are you waiting for? Better yourself in 2018 by heading to audible.com slash Jay's Two Cents or text Jay's Two Cents to 500 500. We're gonna talk about a few things here on a very high level and some of my tips when it comes to each one of these subjects. We're gonna talk about radiators, fans, tubing, mixed metals, coolants, and just some best practices when it comes to your water cooling loop. So whether or not you're a seasoned veteran or a beginner, go ahead and check out this video because you might actually learn something. Who knows, maybe you guys will teach me something that happens often too. But let's go and talk about radiators because I've got a very simple method that I use when it comes to sizing my radiator. There's a lot of things you could talk about in the radiator. There's thickness, there's length, there's width, right? There's, sounds like we're talking about something else here, but I digress. The, the radiator is the most important part of your loop. This is the only thing in your loop taking heat out of it. Sure, you can have the best blocks, you can have the best pump, you can have hard line and best fans, but if you have a terrible radiator, then you're not doing yourself any favors in efficiently removing heat from the system. Same thing can be said for having an undersized radiator in your loop. Your blocks take the heat from the component, your radiator takes the heat out of the loop. That's how it works, it's really simple. So what I like to do is take about 120 millimeters, or that's one 120 millimeter fan worth of radiator per component. So if that wasn't there and we just had a 120, this is why you see 120s being used all the time on CPUs and all-in-one water cooling loop uh, powered GPUs because a single 120 30 mil rad is usually more than enough to handle a standard component and even a little bit of overclocking. Now when you start stacking components in your loop and adding more GPUs and more CPUs or you know, sometimes, I guess you could have a dual, process, a dual processor system, but in my case over here, we've got two GPUs and we've got a CPU monoblock, which means it's also touching the VRMs, which get very hot. So it's much more than just a CPU being heated or cooled by that monoblock over there. What uh, I would typically say is a 240 millimeter worth of radiator per component. That's two 120 millimeter fans, if you're gonna be overclocking. So that means in this system right here, based on my own logic, it would look like I'm a little bit undersized because we've got two GPUs, a CPU and VRM, that's four components. So ideally I would want four 240 millimeters worth of radiators. But that's where thickness comes in because adding thickness increases the surface area or the amount of fins, fin density that the radiator has, which increases its cooling capacity. Now that's where the debate of thickness versus length comes in. Where's the diminishing return? Where's the sweet spot? 120 millimeter fan size and 30 mil thickness is pretty much the standard. But what I'm using over here are 40 mil thick radiators, which is actually adding a decent amount of surface area. So this system, even while overclocked, has more than enough cooling capacity. But there is a diminishing return. You go all the way up to the 60 mil thick rads or even those 80 mil monster rads, uh, it becomes a point where you're gonna have a huge pressure drop across the radiator, where the amount of fans that are, the air that's being pushed through is slowing down dramatically through those radiator fins, which is where you would then need push-pull. And that's a whole different topic. So keep it simple. 120 millimeters per component, if not overclocking, 240 millimeters per component if overclocking and you want to make sure you have plenty of headroom. Now that segues us perfectly into fans because Fans, you're gonna, you're gonna hear two main stats. You're gonna hear static pressure and you're gonna hear airflow optimized. Both fans are gonna move air. The difference is how these fans are going to react when you have resistance in the airflow. So for instance, you've got a radiator here and you've got a fan. The fan has to push air through these fins. Now these fins are lined up straight. They're not angled or anything like that. But if you've ever seen air come off of a fan, it does not blow straight out. It goes out in a cone shape. 
So what's happening is the air coming off the fan is having to straighten itself back out to go through those radiator fins, and that's creating resistance. And the thickness of the radiator determines how much pressure drop there's going to be over that distance. So that's why you have static pressure optimized fans. Fans that are designed to be able to just brute force the air through the resistance to be able to give you the least amount of pressure drop. Now what the main difference that you can tell in these fans is if you look at the fins right here, you'll notice airflow fans have a lot more fins. This is a Corsair airflow fan. This is a static pressure fan from uh, Corsair. Actually, this one's a little bit in the middle. It's not a straight up static, op uh, static pressure optimized fan. It's kind of a middle ground. You could use it on rads or a case. But if you look, you'll see they're much more fins, they're much more angled, and there's a bigger gap between the fins. If you look at this radiator, you can see there's a much smaller gap. So what that means is the air, once it goes through the blade, has no choice but to keep going in the forward momentum. Whereas the gap in these blades, once this hits resistance, the air can kind of splash back out. So that's why you hear the constant debate about airflow fans versus static pressure. Now, usually the difference is minimal between them. I've used airflow, airflow fans on radiators for years because back in the day, there was no such thing as static pressure optimized fans. That was something water cooling made a thing. So we just used whatever fans we had. But at the end of the day, if you're trying to get the most performance out of your loop, then static pressure fans are what you want. Now, one last tip regarding fans and radiators is the idea of push versus pull. Now, push is where the inlet or open side of the fan is where it's feeding air from or pulling air from and pushing the air through the radiator. So we're flowing in this direction. Pull is just the opposite. The fan is on the opposite side of the radiator, pulling the air through the rad first and then exhausting it out the other side. The debate has been which one is more beneficial. Well, the reality is it's about the same regardless. The pressure drop is pretty much the same and you are really gonna be hard pressed to notice any sort of difference in your overall temperatures and day-to-day -day use. That's where push-pull comes in, where you have a fan on either side, so the pressure drop is less noticeable. Push-pull is something I usually reserve for radiators that are really thick, like 60 mil rads, because it's gonna take care of the pressure drop across the radiator. Otherwise, you're just costing yourself a lot more money for a very, very minimal difference in temperatures. Now you can't talk about rads without cleaning. It's important to clean your radiators. The process of building it involves a lot of stuff, right? A lot of solder flux. All those tubes have to be soldered together. The end tanks are soldered together. And as much as the radiator companies and manufacturers clean them, it's still a good process and good practice to clean them yourself. There's different types of products on the market. This is Mayhem's Blitz Pro. I used it with this build right here. It takes about two whole days to get the radiators clean using this product, but it's guaranteed to, to get it clean. It comes with the pH tester to make sure everything is good. So cleaning your radiators is definitely, it's, it's a must in my opinion. Otherwise you could potentially be playing with a disaster in terms of pH imbalance, color changes and other things happening in your loop. Cleaning your radiators is super important. It's best to do it before you build your loop and definitely between fluid changes. You can't talk about water cooling though without getting into the highly debated topic of fluids. Something's happened over the last 20 or 25 years where water cooling's really become a thing Distilled water is no longer good enough. I, I don't actually believe that. What I'm saying is that when it comes to building a boutique system like this, that looks beautiful and has all this flashiness, just dyed water like this uh, for many people isn't good enough, myself included. I'm a bit of a snob in that aspect. But distilled water is honestly all you need. You don't need anything more than distilled water. It's pure, it is, or deionized water is kind of the same thing. You can add dye to this to make it any color you want, but if you're gonna use this, you need to make sure you use an anti-corrosive or kill coil or something to keep growth and corrosion from building up in your loop. Water, water, water is life, and life wants to live in your loop in the form of algae. So you're gonna to want to use a kill coil or PT nuke or an anti-corrosive, whatever. The other thing is you've got these boutique fluids. This right here is the Primo Chill View. It's obviously what I'm using in my, uh, my Green Hornet builder here, so I decided to call it Green Hornet. This right here is the type of fluid that always causes debate. You have these people who are gonna say it's gonna fall out, it's gonna clog, it's gonna build up in your system. And that's a risk I'm willing to take because it looks cool and that's just part of being an enthusiast. If it does do that, then I'll be cleaning out the system and starting all over. And uh, that's the risk I take when I decide to go with these systems. But if you kinda wanna go in the middle, you don't wanna go with something potentially like this and you wanna go with something better than distilled water. Then you look at something like a, a pre-mixed or a concentrate like the Mayhem's X1, XT1, Primo Chills, Got Fluids, XSPC. All the water cooling manufacturers have their own brand of fluid. Typically they are distilled water based fluids. 
that's hard to hold like that. Basically, they're distilled water-based fluids that have anti-corrosives, anti-growth uh, agents that have been, not like secret agents, but they're in there keeping your loop healthy, and you can buy them in pre-mixed colors, concentrate, or get it in clear and mix your own color like I did here. Now, speaking of coolants and anti-corrosive, let's talk about aluminum and mixed metals. Yeah, that's a topic that is obviously very debatable by many people. Don't mix your metals. Never mix your metals. Galvanic corrosion, galvanic corrosion, galvanic corrosion. You're gonna hear it over and over. And yes, it is a very real thing. It's science, you can't deny it. You mix metals and you don't treat the fluid, you're going to get galvanic corrosion. The best course of action is if you're gonna have a copper-based loop like I have here, or nickel-plated copper, then you don't want to add aluminum to your loop. That, is, that means aluminum fittings, aluminum plugs, any of that stuff. Now, of course, the anti-corrosives are definitely going to help, but why introduce the chance of galvanic corrosion? That's why companies like EK have come out with these aluminum kits. And what they've allowed to happen here is you get a custom loop level of cooling capability and performance at the cost of aluminum. Copper is not cheap, it's a precious metal. So pre-built loops like this come with everything you need. The fittings, which are aluminum, the blocks, even the GPU block, they have a GPU block version. I did a review on that. The fans, the plugs, the jumper, this guy right here to power up your power supply, to turn on your pump, to bleed your system. It all comes included. So these are definitely worth checking out. But one thing I wanna point out though, is when people tend to freak out that the idea of aluminum and copper mixed in the same system, all of your AIOs, that are, that are using a copper base are mixed metal. All of the Asatec radiators are aluminum. Your Corsairs and all the other brands out there using Asatec are running mixed metal AIOs. The difference is they're sealed. You're not gonna be having to deal with it or, or service it. And they have specific fluids in them to reduce and nearly eliminate the chances of galvanic corrosion. I wanna kind of wrap things up here with tubing because this is a part where a lot of people kind of get hung up. Do I want to go with rigid tubing? Do I want to try and deal with bending this stuff? It looks cool, but do I want the headache? Or do I just want flex tubing? Right? I just hook everything up and it's flexible and I don't have to worry about how things line up. What are the pros and the cons? Well, the pros to flex tubing, like I just said, is there's, there's cut it, install it, you're done. Right? It's got these locking collar fittings that you could put on there. Or you can get cheap barbed wires and even use zip ties or hose clamps if you want. This is much easier to work with, obviously. But the downside to soft tubing is it almost always clouds over time. Even though the fluid manufacturers do the best they can to try and keep that from happening, you get manufacturers like Primo Chill with the LR2, uh, LRT tubing that's designed to not leach plasticizer. Plasticizer, what do you think makes this flexible, right? So it can leach and turn cloudy. That's something that just, is almost guaranteed to happen with soft tubing. We've been pretty fortunate around here to not have it happen a whole lot. We've had soft tubing on the test bench now for a couple of years. I've changed it once in that time. But it's hard to get any sexier than PETG or acrylic hard tubing. But it's got a lot more work involved. You gotta measure it, you gotta bend it, you gotta cut it. You've gotta buy extra tools, a heat gun. If you're gonna use a jig of some sort or just eyeball it like I do, this is a lot more work. But the end result is usually very, very pleasing. I mean, it's one of those things where you have to determine whether or not you want simplicity and function over, well, just pure sexiness, in my opinion. Or you can go with glass tubing, like I did over here. This is my second time doing glass tubing, and it's not the hardest thing in the world. It's definitely one of the more nerve-wracking ones because, you know, it's glass. But the nice thing about glass is it's not going to stain, it's not going to leach plasticizer, and it's always going to be extra shiny. If you kind of look at this tube up close right here, you can see it's got some scratches on it. It's kind of cloudy. It's just never gonna look as good as glass, but there's that. But when it comes to hard tubing though, I highly recommend PETG because you can't do what I'm about to do with acrylic. This is just the standard PVC cutter from uh, Cobalt. So what is that? Is that Lowe's or Home Depot? Lowe's. Lowe's, okay, doesn't really matter. It's just a blade. And because this is technically a soft plastic, where acrylic, if I tried to do this, it would just shatter. But you can mark where you want to cut and then just cut. It's just that simple. And you can use the same thing to cut your soft tubing as well. So it's a simple tool that costs about 10 bucks that can take care of, well, a lot of, a lot of tasks. Anyway guys, that's where I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up this video. I'll, I will do more of these throughout the summer as I hear people complaining and kind of asking me questions. I'll make videos based on obviously viewer feedback, but these, this is just some 
of my tips when it comes to putting together your loops and kind of shopping and knowing what is what. And I hope this has helped you guys. If, it, if you think it helped somebody, make sure you share it. Thanks for watching today's video. If you're new around here, subscribe. And as always, guys, I will see you in the next one.